What's up guys, on today's episode, we're gonna be addre addressing everything from marking, um, destructive behavior, possessive behavior, and from what it looks like, much, much more on episode 41 of Dog Behavior Question Tuesday. Hey guys, what's going on? I'm Blake Rodriguez with Dream Come True Canine, and this is episode 41 of Dog Behavior Question Tuesday. Today, looks like we got some questions. I've yet to read through them. Um, we'll go ahead with the normal stuff. We'll introduce you guys to the pack, starting over here. We have uh, Cooper over there on the far left, the wolf-looking boy, Andrew. Do you have everybody in the shot? Yep. He's slacking over there. Uh, we have Dizzy. We have Vicente, Julieta, Wilson over there, Echo. Oh my goodness, I almost forgot your name, Gambit. We have Cooper, we have Riley, we have Heidi, Soko, Maxwell, and Samson. Um, on the ones and twos, or <laughs> on the camera is uh, Andrew. And let's, uh, let's jump right into this. Uh, okay, so I am Fat Matt. What's the best way to work through toy aggression with my bulldog. If anyone tries to grab a toy she's playing with, human or another dog, she gets extremely protective of the toy growling and snapping. Um, well, possessive behavior in general um, is, is a lot like most behaviors. They only allow in the environment that, they only exist in the environment that allows it to. Um, what you're looking at is an entitled kind of pushy dog and to an extent possessive behavior is instinctual. You know, but it's not necessary in the world that we live in, in the world that they live in now. Um, you have a dog that has way too much freedom. You have a dog that's displayed behavior and it wasn't addressed in a way where, where it gets them to realize I shouldn't be doing that. And it's also a dog that's tried it and it's worked for them and there's no reason for them to continue it. Um, long story short, like the short answer, you need to stop giving your dog so much freedom bear down on the rules, boundaries, and like limitations, like flat out straightforward, and really dissect and go through all of our Dog Behavior Question Tuesday episodes. We actually have them indexed for you um, on our website, dctk9.com. Company name is Dream Come True Canine, letter K, number nine. Um, and go to the blog, we have a, a index, and you really need to start from scratch. Get your dog to understand leash pressure, Start working your dog for food where it comes from you. I'm not talking like sitting for five minutes and then like yesing your dog, right? Your dog needs to know leash pressure. Your dog needs to know recall. You have to start from scratch. Possessive behavior, especially like in a dog that is like, let's say like the breed is stubborn um, or loyal, that type of behavior, um, what you're looking at would be like the equivalent of, of obesity, Right, um, and this, this actually might might uh, strike a chord with you because you say I am was it I am Fat Matt? Is that what the, what, what the name was? Um, this may or may not strike a chord with you, but like there's a there's a very big difference between someone who's like gained a little bit of winter weight and is trying to get ready, trying to get beach ready, and then someone who's obese. Right now, like you're obese, and your goal, um, which is trying to solve possessive behavior, is saying that you want to run a triathlon. We're not getting you ready and we're not even trying to tackle a triathlon yet. We need you to start walking around the house. We need you to stop driving to the deli. We need you to start like paying attention and just changing your diet. Don't even worry about the gym stuff yet. And when you start to lose weight from that and you're looking good, then we have to push. Then we have to get you jogging. Then we have to get you in the weight room in the gym. Then we have to get you like doing this and that, jogging a mile before you even get to like a 5K. So you actually have a lot of steps but it's doable, it's just a matter of like this question, very straight, simple, and forward, how bad do you want it? That's it, like honestly, there's no other way around it. Um, from here on out, now what I'm gonna say is if you really wanna make this happen, you have to understand that you and your family and your wife or your girlfriend, whoever you live with, has to start changing what you're doing and how you're acting with your dog because you guys might have not created the behavior 
but you're definitely reinforcing it, whether it's unintentional or not. Now, that doesn't mean you're a bad guy. I don't think you're a bad guy. It's just, I, I need you to uh, get to the point where you understand the severity of, of the situation and what it takes to fix it, because it can be fixed. I don't care how many trainers you've been to, what they said, what they knew how to do, what they didn't know how to do. I'm telling you, we do it every single day, right? So with that said, go back through everything, check out our blog, check out our relevance blog, that's really important. Um, get your dog good on leash pressure, understand the markers, teach those markers, good yes and nope, and start working your dog to a point where their choices matter. It's that simple as that, right? Um, that's, it's, it's really hard to kind of dissect this one because when you have a behavior that strong, there's a lot of foundation work we need to accomplish. But once we get foundation work, there's actually a video on our YouTube page that I put out that uh, addresses how we teach. I forget what it's called. We, we got to figure that out, Andrew. It's like how to teach like an out, drop it, or like leave it command, kind of like the steps for how we go about it. We, we do it in a non-confrontational way, then we step in. I'll try and see if we can link um, uh, link a video right here or put it into the description of the video for you. But basically it's like the dog's good on leash pressure, we're calling the dog off of an item, which starts with kind of food because food a dog can eat but they can't take a bowl with them, a toy or something they can take with them and come back to you. So you kind of need that food there. You gotta be able to call your dog off, your dog knows recall first with a leash or a long line so you're not confrontational, the dog comes off, you reward with something with higher value, you get that really, really good where a dog could be eating and instead of guarding and eating faster, they know to come off and that's the mixture of teaching the recall behavior and then proofing the recall behavior where it's not a choice. From there, there's also getting a dog solo with leash pressure where if a dog knows place and they're stepping off a place, you can nope them with either remote leash and or spatial pressure and they know how to kind of back up. So an example of this, Andrew, could, could we like maybe kind of get you in the shot really quickly, um, even if we had to back this up, just to show an example of like, of um, kind of like spatial pressure. I'll, I'll assume I'm on place here. So imagine like I'm on one of these place boards. Um, I don't know where you're gonna stand, because I, I want them to kind of see like that that like relationship. So now all of a sudden I'm on place and I'm getting off and he nopes right on that nope leash remotes and spatial pressure as he's stepping in. I sit good, he eases off. We need to get to the point that when he has a food bowl, we start to teach the out commands. You can do this with two people. You can, if he knows leash pressure and he knows how to follow it, he's not fighting through it. Now what you can do is, nope. Now what you can do is, good. See, that's like a perfect example right there. Yeah. Now what you can do is, you can have, if I'm the dog, instead of calling me over to you, now I'm over here, I'm eating this food bowl, Andrew has a leash, I start stepping in and say out, and he applies the leash pressure right when I start coming off, that might have to be firm in the beginning, it might have to be soft depending on how severe this is and where we are, the leash pressure shuts off, I shut off, good boy, and I walk over to the dog and I give the dog something of higher value. So we need to like, like literally like change the way the dog perceives me stepping into something that he thinks he possesses. Another like kind of thing I'm gonna end on, dogs can only be possessive when they're in a position to possess something. So in the beginning, when you're not at the stage or level that you need to be, you can still control your environment to make sure that a dog's not in a situation to basically be a jerk and be dangerous to your family or any dogs around him or her, okay? Um, Next question, what seven hearts? How can I stop my yellow lab from marking in the house? Even if he's in place, he sneaks out of it and ends up marking. I find that out later, so too late to use the e-collar. Does neutering make a difference in your opinion? Thank you. Okay, first off, um, neutering's not gonna change anything. Neutering might stop an instinctual kind of behavior, a hormonal kind of like, you know, kind of I'm gonna kind of pee and mark this. But overall, there's a couple things that we have to look at. If your dog is holding place and your dog is in a position to break off without you realizing, then that's an operator error. You need to be in a position where if your dog is holding place um, and the dog's gonna break up, you're there to catch it. Otherwise, it's good timing and place has no relevance and no meaning and no value. Now, your dog might be good when you're in sight and you have to practice kind of doing things blindly here and there. And we have videos to kind of show that. But if you're in a position where you know you're gonna shower or you know you can't supervise your dog, you need to cradle your dog, crate your dog, right? That's the, the exact reason why like, we put babies in cradles when we're not watching them. 
When we go to take a shower, we don't leave like the newborn baby out. We put the baby in a cradle for their safety. So the dog's not able to practice certain behaviors while you're gone. Now if the dog is peeing in the crate, then we have more of an anxious behavior. But marking behavior needs to be caught and needs to be addressed and we have to help teach habits. And in order to teach habits, we need to be there to coach and be on that person's ass. That's like saying, how can I um, prevent, uh, again, well, let's go back to the fitness trainer. Um, analogy, how can I prevent my um, client from doing this exercise without having bad form? They have good form when I'm watching them, but the second I go away to start eating some donuts and talk to my friends, I turn away and I realize that they were doing it with like hunched form. The answer, you need to make sure that you're in a position to kind of catch that and correct that, okay? Um, that's an operator error thing, and, and your timing has to be good. And it, the timing has to be good in a way where you're catching it so that when you're gone, the dog also considers that and goes, you know what, maybe even though they're not here, I don't want to kind of do that. And that's, that's habitual. We have to create these habits for our dogs because right now without you, they don't have the habits. I don't have the habit of having good posture until someone drills it and drills it and drills it. And then maybe one day I can sit through an entire DBQ Tuesday episode like this. But a lot of times I'm like this right? And there's no one here to correct it, so I'm going to stay like this. Think about that, right? Um, Geektard. Hi, Blake. I was, and actually, hold on one second. On our Instagram stories, I just put an alarm clock post. Go to our Instagram page, Dream Come True Canine. Click on the story. It's only there for 24 hours, and you'll get what I mean. That alarm clock, alarm clock theory and concept is exactly what you need to be doing with your dog. Um, Geektard. Hi, Blake. I was just wondering what choice is best on a walk when you pass another dog. Should I keep my dog in between myself and the other dog so that I can redirect my dog, or should I be between the other dog and my dog? Sorry if my question is a bit weird. Hope you understand what I mean. Actually, you're like, I don't know if, if you maybe got this idea from us, because we've spoken about this a couple times before, and I don't hear a whole lot of other trainers uh, speak about this, but I, your question is not weird at all. I think it's actually, um, I'm so glad that somebody asked this. So let's go ahead and assume that Cooper is my dog and I'm walking him. And right now I'm kind of walking this way. If a dog is coming over this way and I need to walk by them, for me, I prefer to have me be on the opposite side of the dog, meaning that my dog is in between me and the other dog because it's a lot easier on our muscles, even though we don't want it to be a muscle battle, but in general, it's also a lot easier for a dog to see a distraction or another dog and have to choose between focusing on you or on the dog or focusing on what I am asking for. And in this case, I'm on this side. So, I'm saying, nope, don't focus on that. Controlling the head. Anytime I'm using leash, I'm trying to steer the head and shut pressure off. The body follows the head, right? So I'm zoning in on a dog. Here comes me with a leash. We're creating this. Pressure comes off. And I can, sh I can basically say, don't focus on this. Focus on this. Now, if I'm in between that, which is going to happen, that's inevitable. But whenever possible, I try to avoid that. If I'm in between and now I'm, now I'm, over, I'm walking this dog, or let's say I'm still walking this dog. I'm walking him, and now this dog is coming along this way, and I'm in between. I have to like kind of move my dog out of the way, and there's a way to do that that we teach as well, but starting off for the dog and the handler, it for some reason is always a lot more difficult, especially when your dog does have strong habits to kind of disregard you and your leash pressure. You want to have better timing, so it's easier to kind of do follow me pressure versus yield to me pressure when we're dealing with a distraction. Down the road, you have to train both. It's, it, actually, that's a great question. So going back to the, uh, that's a great point, rather. Going back to um, what I'm going to uh, say what Andrew just said, going back to teaching the out command, it's exactly what we do, uh, which is the question that I answered in, in, um, just before. In the beginning, we're recalling away, calling away, calling away. It's easier for a dog to learn it. It's easier for us to follow through and be successful, right? But when I'm stepping in, dogs struggle with yielding pressure in general, and when, when we're talking about distractions, uh, especially when a dog might kind of snap or redirect on you or whatever, that behavior stepping in and having a leash go away, especially for one person, that's why I suggest sometimes uh, that drill is a two-person job. It's really difficult, right? So, um, so it can be done and it should be practiced and, and we do it all the time, but at the same time, um, in the beginning, I suggest being on the opposite side. 
Great question, great question. What else here? Um, okay, so Jen said she's also having uh, trouble with timing with her e-collar on walks. Her chihuahua schnauzer or schnauzer freaks out when dogs walk by, even though his confidence is much greater after his e-collar training. I don't want to aggravate the situation. He seems to do better with enticing him with treats. So here's the thing that you have to think about. Um, you know if you follow us that we're huge, huge advocates of like using food. We actually use food way more than most people to the point where sometimes it, it almost is a little bit ridiculous, but we understand the value of it, right? Um, the problem that I tend to encounter, now when it comes to walking dogs, there's some people that like don't have, it's not as much of a necessity as it is for us. We're in New York City. Walking your dog on leash and teaching leash manners is a priority. Being walking by distractions, like I don't know anywhere else really where it's, it's this um, extreme, right, as far as like distractions and all that stuff. So basically what I want to get at, let, let me actually um, kind of look at this. When we're looking at treats, if you have a dog that is, let's see, is freaking out when he sees other dogs, the problem is not necessarily the physical behavior freaking out. That's the problem by our standards, but that's more of a symptom of what the problem is. The problem is that your dog is becoming heightened. I use the word concerning. I don't even know if that's an actual word, but your dog is not Jamaican man, no worries, a Jamaican on weed seeing a dog and chilling. Your dog is like walking and seeing this and freaking out. The problem with using food in this context and scenario, at least I've found, and you can change it a little bit. I've experimented with, with it before, but I just don't like, like, I don't like the results, the way it looks, is that you have a dog that's here. And when you're using food, you're using a form of bribery where the state of mind, the heightened concern, stays the same. And that's what we're trying to tackle. That's what we're trying to change. You want a dog to be able to see a dog and be like, cool. You don't want a dog to be able to see a dog like this and then all of a sudden see your treats and take the treats and go back and be over here and stay here. We need to change this and get this. So when you get that and do that, if you use food at that point, now, if you use food and you're not quick to use food, you're, nope, you're trying, down bud, you're trying to use food in a way that when you see a state of mind change, good. You can reward that. Now you're rewarding for good behavior, right? You're not rewarding trying to get good behavior. Think about that. A lot of people use, let's say, money to negotiate and reward in hopes that they get good behavior. We're using food to reward once you give us good behavior. And in this situation, when you're at that point, that's how you have to use it. In early stages and foundation building, you can totally use food to teach lures and stuff like that, but we're talking behavior once you're here. Not foundation, kindergarten, like sit to shake, all that stuff, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Um, what I will say, good. Yeah, no. yeah, place, what are you doing? You're supposed to be the, one of the trained ones. Um, that, so that's a good point. Andrew is saying like a lot of what we've been doing lately, and I think this is a, a, a big missing piece of the puzzle, is that when we're using food in that context, we're using food when we get a really nice, appropriate response and choice, a correct choice that we've nurtured, to the aversive that we give, the correction, whether it's remote, whether it's leash, whether it's verbal, whatever it is, when we get that response and the dog kind of looks and is like, is that the right choice? Good job, there you go. So if you're using it that way, awesome. Versus using it to try to get good behavior, no bueno, right? Um, another thing that you need to kind of look at is you might be using a remote collar in a way where, and I kind of, I think I covered this in the last episode also, or it was definitely a Q and A. Um, do we have a, no, that's fine. Um, is that a lot of people are using corrections too soon. 
The dog doesn't understand why they're getting corrected. The dog doesn't understand what they should be doing instead. And anytime we're using that tool or the tool in that context, it's only for this situation. So over time, it starts to create uh, stress. And sometimes you see a dog that sees this and now wants to make you go away because he knows every time he sees this, he's gonna feel this or he's gonna feel this or he's gonna feel whatever it is. And now he's like, I gotta make you go away to avoid this happening. So it's not clear why, it's, why he's getting corrected or why he's getting certain sensations. And that's what you need to spend time uh, teaching more. So you might need to take a couple steps back to teach that. Then when you put it into a more real world situation, the dog wants, knows what to do when you get the right choice, reward it and keep it moving, give him more space or her. All right? Um, Let's see, Miss Kelly Chang, hello, how do I correct negative behavior when interacting with other dogs? For example, when my dog is greeting another dog and begins to show some signs of aggression, how do I correct it? Thank you for your help. Um, so I don't know exactly like what you're dealing with and what we're seeing, but what we see all the time, nine times out of 10, we're looking at two things. Um, one, you're allowing your dog to just walk up to dogs or dogs to just walk up to your dog while on leash, and that creates a lot of tension. A lot of times, um, you need to change your dog's state of mind and be able to walk by dogs, walk with your dogs without your dog expecting to meet. One of the early foundation things that you can teach is place. Teach how to just do this. These dogs have no intention of meeting each other. They're just like, oh, cool, there's other dogs. Have that be a regular thing. And when the dog's state of mind is cool, there's a dog, there's a dog, and he's really relaxed, then maybe a soft smell, and then you can tap tap the leash or kind of leash pressure if your dog knows this and guide them out, really good job, and slowly build the foundation. You also have to make sure that the other dogs are not like super, super pushy because when they're over here and they're nose to nose and they're kind of smelling and then they kind of lock, there's this tension and this expectation that they're gonna determine what's going on and nothing comes from you so it's just this, this freeze in this moment and then boom, there's this kind of clash. Now if it's happening off leash, your dogs are too heightened and your dogs don't know how to be polite. It's either your dog or a mixture of the other dog and you guys aren't even trying to buy, like, like, it's like me not even trying to buy the girl a drink. I'm just trying to grab her, take her home, and go. It's like, that's not how you meet. That's not a proper way to, like, shake hands. So we need dogs to be more curious. You only see curiosity coming out when dogs are a little bit more calm. But if dogs are always meeting, we're on leash, and they're pulling on leash, we let them meet. It's heightened. They go to the dog park, and when they go to the dog park, they're heightened, and they meet. And then they go to the daycare, and they're heightened, and they go to play, they don't know how to actually shake hands. Shaking hands is the calm, very nice to meet you. The conversation before this. Does that make sense? That's what you have to spend time doing. So your dog needs to understand more impulse control and you have to see when your dog is concerning. It's not just, oh, my dog just wants to meet. Let's see how this goes. Because it's a 50-50 shot whether your dog is gonna be successful or not, but you're leaving it 100% up to the dogs. So you're not a part of the equation. Another one that I would say go to our blog on our website and read the relevance blog. It's really, really important. Did you have something you were gonna add there? Um, just in general, like with, with the, just like corrections in like general, like the foundation is really important. Like people overlook that. Like, yeah. Um, that, that makes a huge difference in how dogs react to the university. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. So like w w you hear us, if you've been following us for a while, you hear us talk about it over and over and over again. And to some people that like it, it might not resonate, it, even to me sometimes, it almost sounds repetitive. Like the answer is kind of almost the same for, for, for everybody. It's like you gotta understand foundation, but what people don't realize, like even with our, do with our trainers here, like there are steps to how we start getting them to the point of problem solving. What we're doing is like we're working on foundation, like our trainers, we're working on them understanding how to just do basics of this, this, and this, walk the dog here, do this, and then they get to a point where they're learning how to feed, and their body's moving, and their leash is moving, and, and everything, how, they, how they're fluid and fluent with like their remote and everything. And then when they get there, and they get really good at doing the basics, and they don't see how like this stuff connects with addressing problems, they go, hey, you know all this stuff that we taught you here, how to do this? The dog already knows that language, this leash. The dog already knows the remote, knows this, knows this. So now when we go to tackle this, it's really easy for you to be clear and it's really easy for the dog to understand what you're talking about and, and what you're asking for. And we can't like stress it enough without a clear foundation and clear communication and there's different language that you're teaching your dogs with all these tools that you use, addressing behavior problems is extremely difficult. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're having the success and a lot of other people are really, really struggling and say you can't fix this or you can't fix that or it's, you have this battle between management and like mitigation and mitigating. Um, it's, it's, 
people don't understand how to connect it to. You have really good people that are fantastic at teaching like, like dog tricks and like basic obedience, and you have people who, like, it's just, it's, they're not seeing how to put the pieces together. So this is what, like, I, it's almost like I'm a broken record when I say your dogs need to know this basic foundation stuff because it puts us in a really good place to tackle problems. Oh, is he, okay. But, um, so he's getting picked up by Jen. Um, but without that, you guys are gonna struggle. And what you'll find is when you have this stuff really good and you stress the little things, the, 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 the serious stuff isn't even there anymore. The serious stuff isn't even there anymore. It's, it's, and whatever's still lingering, it's extremely easy to address because communication goes back and forth. It's this give and take relationship, right? So it's really, really important. Um, let's see, Holly's, Holly Snow, Snowera, or Holly, we're just gonna say Holly, yeah. I've had my dog Holly for two years. She comes every time she is called. My boyfriend recently adopted a new rescue um, called Harley. She is getting great at recall too. Their names are so similar, so they both become, oh, they both come every time I call one, and I feel like I can't correct the one who wasn't supposed to because I'm afraid they'll get confused. Okay, so my question for you is, do you think it's possible to train them to understand the difference between Holly and Harley? That's kind of a tongue twister. English isn't my first language, and I do the training and walking. Or should I come up with a different come name for Harley so they know who I mean to call by who I focus on? Um, I'm so unsure how to go about this. Thanks. Love you guys and hope to come to your center. Okay, cool. So, Copper, down. So basically... What I'm gonna go ahead and say is change the second dog's name. Like, why not? Your, your boy just recently adopted. The name doesn't mean shit. It really doesn't. It's like, like you can teach your dog's name to be Strawberry. It's like, my dog's name is Soko. I hardly ever even call him by his name. I have, the, the amount of nicknames that I have for him are freaking ridiculous. Samson is my brother's dog's name. I call him Sito. I call him Sito Bito. He responds to Sito. You know what I mean? Like, Sam, like it's just ridiculous. Soko's name is like, it's like like, or Maxwell, for example, we call him Donkey, we call him Baby Hippo, we call him Donkey Boy, and like, that's the stuff that he recalls to. Like, I hardly ever call him Maxwell. Sometimes I'm even calling him Max. Soko is Turd, Turd Man, Turdcito. It's ridiculous the amount of names that we have for them. So, Soko Loco, I, it's just, it, I, I can go on forever. Um, I would just change a dog's second name. Like, and English is not your, not your first language, even if it was. Like, that's tough for me. What was the dog, the two dogs recently that we kept? that like, we realized like, what, what was going on. It was like, um, oh man, there were two dogs where every time we like, called them, one was coming, and then I realized, oh man, they sound exactly alike. It, it, might, it wasn't Cooper and Copper, it was like something with an E. It was like, almost like Riley and like, like um, uh, anyway, like, you, you get my point. And what we really had to do is we had to like, really, like, um, I'm gonna say a different name, Sparky. Sparky here, Marky here, and like really talk about our, like our language. And I mean, technically you can change like the come kind of command, but still it's like the come, one's come and one's here, but a dog is still thinking that they're hearing their name. So that can be difficult unless you're not saying their names at all. But if you're not saying their names at all and you're saying here and you're saying come, then you might as well just change like the second dog's name. You know what I mean? That would be my advice for you. Otherwise, yeah, you're looking at two recall names. I would just change that second dog's name, especially if you just rescued it, it was a shelter. It probably didn't even know his name anyway. I mean, like I said, I don't even call Soko by his name, Soko, so. Oh. Storm is on what? Is he? Yeah. One of our dogs is on the doggest, awesome. Um, screenshot that, we'll post that on our Instagram page. Last one, speaking of which, Storm. Donovan Fred, hi Blake, I'm wondering how to deal with destructiveness. My dog ate part of his bed when I stripped it to wash the cover. He knows better, obviously he doesn't, but I didn't discover it until coming back from the laundry. I did say no bad dog, is there anything else I can do? Yeah, you gotta crate your dog. If your dog is not responsible enough to do that, you absolutely have to address it. You can begin to kind of test things and use like a drop cam and see what your dog does, and, and you can do some act of God corrections, which I don't talk about a lot. I'm not like a, a huge fan, but I understand the, the place for them. Um, but overall, I would say that you were in a position where you should have cradled your baby, your dog, your child jumped out the window, 
and, and, and we were in a position where we're, we're saying, how do we prevent that from happening? Where it's like, just make sure that, one, you have screen guards on your window, you can do that, or you can make sure your, your baby's not even in a position to kind of get there, right? Or like, oh my gosh, my dog ate chocolate. Your dog wouldn't have even been in a position to eat chocolate if like, if like it held, it held a place or was crated. In this situation, a crate is holding a place with reinforcement so that when you're not there to address it, your dog can't do much. But the reality is like, if you're, I actually know your dog, your dog struggles with anxiety, leaving your dog as you head out, like just kind of to its own devices, that came from an anxious place. You want to address anxiety, you have to have your dog hold positions and be okay with it. If your dog struggles in the crate, that's just a reflection of your dog would struggle outside also and get into trouble or feel comfortable and isn't being challenged. You gotta continue challenging your dog to the point where they kind of know how to chill. Exercise helps before you kind of put the dog in the crate, but like in those situations, um, if the dog had the time to do that, then it was too much time alone. And unless we're able to kind of actually monitor and supervise, we, we, we have to uh, make sure the dog's not in a position to make that mistake where we can't address it. Um, if you're gonna start easing away from the crate and have your, leaving your dog out a little bit, we have to do a better job of like puppy proofing, regardless of how, dog, how old the dog is. It's really important. Um, and, and that's just basic like management in the beginning. Like we all like kind of make mistakes. Like my dog knows better. Um, Maxwell is like kind of one of our newer guys. So when we take him home, like we make sure the garbage isn't overflowing. Now he doesn't have an issue with that. And if he did, I would definitely catch it and address it. But at the same time, like, I'm trying to make sure I'm not like setting him up for disaster. So like what we don't want to do is we don't want him to like, like we don't want your dog who's a, a recovering anxious alcoholic, he's a recovering alcoholic, to be left alone with like a 30 pack and, and like a bottle of scotch while you go ahead out in the laundry like right in his face. It's just too much of a temptation at the moment. We have to work toward him being responsible enough where sure there's alcohol in the house, but like you know better. So we have to be a better sponsor at this stage and this point in the game. Cool? Awesome. Um, and that wraps it up for episode 41. Guys, thank you so much. Um, this will go up Tuesday evening. And yeah, I'll see you guys in episode 42.